everyone. Uh, welcome to the first robotics colloquium of the decade. Uh, we've made it through one decade. Here's, here's to the next one. Uh, and no better person to start this than Nima. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Nima. Uh, Nima, uh, this is PhD at UC Boulder with uh, Gabe Sibley, uh, doing some really remarkable things with small cars that I hope he'll show. Um, this is an inspiration for our own race cars that we have here at UW. And then after that, he went off and co-founded um, a company called Canvas Technologies that built uh, autonomy solutions, uh, carts for uh, indoor navigation, uh, which was then uh, recently acquired by, by Amazon. Um, and so Nima is part of the sort of the Amazon family. Um, uh, Nima's uh, done some really remarkable work, not just on the theoretical side of things, but also in bringing robotics out to the real world. Um, both in terms of SLAM, as well as localization, mapping, all of that. Uh, and today he's going to talk about something different, uh, and so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, Nima asked me what he should be talking about. I was like, yeah, talk about whatever you want, and I think he took that very literally. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, super excited to, to have Nima here. He's going to be here until 5 o'clock today. Uh, his meeting slots are really booked, but if you want to chat with him anytime, please send him email or try to grab him right after the talk. So without further ado, Nima. Thank you, Sid. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Three years ago, I found myself at a customer site. And I was looking at one of our robots motionless in a doorway. The robot looked similar to the one you see up here. It looked like a push cart that drove itself. and. The site of the customer uh, facility was similar as well. It was an industrial, you know, industrial site that we were operating in. I was standing next to a, a colleague of mine who was, who was non-technical. He was there from a service standpoint, and he was frustrated. He was looking at this robot, and he said something like, come on, just, just move. And I was there feeling like the designer of this robot, and I, I didn't know what was going on. And I could see that my, my colleague was frustrated. I could see that the customer was really confused, and in the middle of it, this, this robot just sitting there. And this memory is really clear in my mind because of the confluence, all, all of these different, different uh, levels of helplessness that I felt. Anyway, we eventually got sick of this and pushed it through the doorway, and it went along this merry way. I see this everywhere now, and uh, it, it, it's something that keeps taking me back to that moment. I see it when a robot tries to pick something out of a container and then accidentally picks the side of the container. I see it when our own robot was stuck in that doorway. I've seen it in state-of-the-art autonomous vehicles where we're in it, and suddenly it taps the brakes, and we all lurch forward. And I've been in calls with companies where I've asked them about how something works, a theory of operation of something that they've built. And they say that they don't know, because it's essentially a black box from, let's say, pixels to motors. And I always get this answer. We don't know. There are some guesses. Since that incident at the doorway, we've come a long way. But the, the lesson has, has stuck with me, that complex systems, robots being one of them, can really benefit from being explainable. And when I say explainable, I mean that term in the sense of being explainable to humans to us, being not, not just being mathematically interp interpretable, but for us as humans, as designers and operators, to be able to understand why they're doing the things that they're doing. And since then, we have tried to build robots that can have their actions be explainable to us and to our customers. And this has helped us be able to predict when they're going to be successful to be able to diagnose when they don't work, and to build trust with our customers. So the ideas that I'm going to present in this talk are simple. They're intuitive. 
And they're based on my experience building these robots. And I hope that they motivate you to think about this in your own projects. I'm also hoping to offer some really simple guidelines that have helped us build robots that are were easier to explain. And I hope those are helpful. So how did I end up in that doorway with the non-responsive robot? Let, let me rewind a little bit. So as Sid was saying, I, I started my PhD at the Autonomous Robotics and Perception Group at the George Washington University with Professor Gabe Sibley. The lab later moved to CU while I was doing my PhD. And as one does in these sort of events, I moved with it. And that's when I, that's where I wrapped it up. Now the, the lab is under the direction of Professor Chris Heckman. He's at the right there at the front row. And I'm not in this picture because I had graduated by then. I did two things during my PhD. I, I, I worked on control of agile ground vehicles, which is a voluble way of saying we got RC cars and we made them do jumps and loops and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. And the second thing I worked on was localization uh, using visual and inertial information, or visual inertial SLAM. Uh, and this was informed by the work with the jumping cars. And when cars jump, they tend to just hit things. They lose calibration. And so as part of that work with SLAM, we also wanted to see if we could recalibrate all the different senses live as it was happening. So we started this in 2012. And one of the first things we did was we got a bunch of RC cars and we modded them so that we could send wireless commands to them. We used uh, Connect Fusion, uh, which was a work with uh, Richard Newcomb to create geometry uh, from, from the, the playground we had built with loops and ramps. And we used a motion capture system fused with an IMU to get pose. The way we controlled them was something we called simulation in the loop, which is a made up term. But what it means is that there is a game engine simulator, physics simulator, which was actually Bullet, that's running very quickly in the scenes, non-differentiable. We wrap a trajectory optimizer around it. And then we try to get what the vehicle is doing to converge to a reference trajectory. And this actually ended up working, which was something we weren't really sure would happen. Uh, to do it, the simulator had to be very close to reality. So we had to build a model ID framework around it to figure out things like the friction coefficients, dynamic, uh, static, the inertia mass of the vehicle, motor torque constants. These all had to be dialed in using model ID. And it allowed us to run on really complex 3D environments like the ones you see here. And it ended up being quite repeatable. Do, doing the resembled? Domain Were you model. optimizing with respect to a single model, or did you do something like an ensemble of models at runtime? Single, single model, yeah. So the model was trained uh, rather optimized parameters for this particular setting. And it ended up being quite robust to perturbations. You can see in this particular figure eight, there's quite a lot of slip as the vehicle makes its left hand turn. Uh, and we were able to run that loop fast enough that we could deal with a lot of these perturbations. Because we were airborne, we could do more interesting things, like use the inertia of the wheels to get the car to flip. Now, I want to caveat this that we never did the work to put this into the control framework. So this was very much a if airborne, then do this, then land. But it requires a level of precision on that jump that is impossible to do by hand. And I got very good at driving these. And I could never do them. There's about 100 milliseconds of delay between commands set and commands executed, which means by the time you're on the ramp, 
you've already sent the commands that will be executed on the RAM. So it, it requires the model to be quite dialed in. This is a great way to break RC cars. And uh, the, the loop was the best way to do it. And here you can see uh, Stephen Lovegrove, a, a colleague of mine, very generously offering his extremely <laughs> valuable time catching RC cars. <laughs> He was really good at it. He's also running at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so this was all done with motion capture. And we thought that wasn't, that wasn't quite right. So we wanted to get rid of the motion capture. And that took us pretty quickly to visual inertial slam. Uh, visual, I, I don't need to convince you guys of that, but the inertial part was important because just of what we were doing. When we were doing backflips or when we were at the top of the loop-the-loop, the loop, there would be times where we would need to carry over pose with inertial information. And I already spoke about the work to recalibrate uh, sensors on the fly. So at the time we were doing this, a lot of the work with visual inertial was done using filters that would uh, marginalize information out the, out the back of them. And this would be a way to carry prior information forward and the work we did here was to, to get rid of that marginalization. We created a framework that would allow us to just use conditioning instead, and it made it easier to do things like detect uh, calibration fairly, like in this video, a, a severe change in focal length, and go back in time and fix the pieces of the puzzle that were affected by that change, because they were no longer locked in a prior. So this was a self-calibration framework that we worked on uh, as part of the second half of the PhD. So we have agile ground robots. We have some form of localization. We combine it together, and we get some kind of high-speed autonomous ground vehicle, right? Well, not quite. As it turns out, the robots we ended up building were very slow and moved very smoothly. This was a TechCrunch video from 2017 showcasing some of the videos we were building, some of the robots we were building at the time. And as you can see, there are no jumps, definitely no loops. This startup was called Canvas, as, as Sid uh, mentioned. And our mission was to deploy long-term vision-based mobile autonomy to drive efficiency in manufacturing and logistics. Our product was what you see in this picture, the Canvas Cot. It is a computer vision based autonomous robot. It looks like a push cot, and that's by design. And it's meant to be very easy to use, very quick to set up, one to two hours, you get going, and uh, uses a web interface to access all the functionality. Um, and the key aspect of it is that it can deal with the short-term and long-term change in an environment such as a manufacturing facility or a warehouse. These sort of environments have lots of people moving around. That's your short-term change. But they also completely rearrange themselves in a matter of days and weeks. Its primary sensors are two pairs of stereo cameras, one at the front and one at the back. Using those stereo cameras, the robot does everything from mapping to detection to classification, uh, localization, and eventually navigation. Still using Kinect Fusion, or do you like something else? No more Kinect Fusion. Yeah, this is using passive stereo uh, with a much simpler fusion uh, system. But, but still building, a, building an explicit geometric model. Yes, uh, yes. We, we had to deal with the fact that the space was changing so much, so we couldn't lock everything down into sort of a single coordinate frame of geometry. Um, but we still had to build geometry over time because the things that you don't want to uh, navigate into, uh, they're not all classifiable. So we have, to, we have to deal with geometry at some point. I had the privilege of starting this company with three other amazing co-founders. You can see them here, Sandra, Juan, and Jonathan. And together with the rest of Canvas, we built an amazing team in Boulder, Colorado. That's where we are now as part of Amazon. 
The team comprises scientists and engineers specializing in perception, in motion planning, and in building high-performance, scalable, real-time systems. We also built a very dedicated service team to uh, take care of these robots as they were deployed, one of the members of which was standing next to me in the anecdote at the beginning of this talk. Together, we iterated through tens of hardware and software designs to continuously iterate what we were building, some of the earliest of which were made completely out of wood. And we ended up deploying robots into production processes nationwide. And in 2019, uh, which is last year, uh, uh, we were acquired by Amazon and now continue that mission to drive efficiency in Amazon's fulfillment network using mobile autonomy as part of Sid's organization. So the thoughts and ideas in the rest of this talk are based on that experience and are motivated by the continual understanding of why our robots do the things they do as we subject them continuously to an almost unbounded set of scenarios in their day-to-day -day activities. So what is explainability? It's somewhat self-explanatory. It, it's the ability for the actions of some system, some complex system, to be explainable to us as people, as humans, in the moment or afterwards. If you consider these systems as functions, their outputs are informed by their inputs and some prior. And what we're interested in, or at least what I'm interested in, is making that relationship explainable so I can understand what's going on. In the vignette of the robot stuck in the doorway, the explainability towards the operators would be the indication that something was in the way, that the robot was trying to get somewhere and some obstacle had been classified as blocking that path, bonus would be where that obstacle was and where the path was. That, that already assumes that the robot is kind of rational, but it could be something else. Right? That's right. <laughs> the, the, the system itself might not lend itself to explainability. And I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about that. For, for me as a designer, I would want to know a little bit more. I, I might want to know the visualization of the classification of obstacles, or I might not want to know the exact path in the, in the coordinate space that the vehicle is itself localized to, or a more in-depth human understandable explanation between inputs and outputs. But these two are just different levels of the same thing. Humans, we've been talking a lot about, themselves are very explainable, remarkably so, although I don't think we always know this. An example that really uh, brings this to my mind is this uh, project called Velocipedia by uh, Gianluca Gimini in Italy. He started in 2009 and he asked people, random people on the street, to draw him a sketch of a bicycle in two minutes or less. Unsurprisingly, most people cannot do this very well. So what you end up with is a very creative renderings of bicycles, none of which quite work. This is four examples that uh, kind of made me laugh. And <laughs> Gianluca was, he was very clever. He found the, the best ones and he made 3D models of it. So let's, let's dive a little deeper. Uh, take a look at this picture and raise your hand if you can see what's wrong with this bike. Right, like we, we can, yeah, we can all see it. And there's, let's be frank, there's a lot wrong with this bike. <laughs> but most of us would probably be able to just say, hey, there are no pedals on this bike. So the answer to, is there something wrong to this bike for us is not yes or no, it's, well, yes, but there's all of these things that I've identified. This is true even though, and this might be hard to admit, if Jean-Luc asked, us to draw these bikes, we might not fare much better than the renderings that you saw before. What that tells me is that the average human is not a good generative model of a 2D drawing of a bike. 
And this same kind of explainability is explored in lots of ML models today, for, for example, as part of the DARPA X, XAI program. But it also applies to classical models, classical systems, or hybrid systems that might have classical components or ML components. The challenges are slightly different. In a classical system, comprised of components that interact with one another, there might be semantically meaningful signals between those components that explain the output, but they may be inaccessible. So that there needs to be a change of architecture to bring those signals out. Contrast that with an ML model, where even if those signals were available, the semantic meaning of those might be unknown to us. So we cannot derive an explanation. What, what I'm interested in this talk is exploring explainability at the system level, although it has a very deep and obvious relationship with explainability at the component level. I'd like to take a moment to just mention interpretability. The explainability that I'm talking about, like I mentioned before, is human-centric. And it is different to just the notion of mathematical interpretability between inputs and outputs. And why does that matter? It matters because of some of the advantages that I'll go through later, but primarily that of being able to predict what will happen when a system enters the domain of its operation. And the human explainable, explainability of a system allows a designer to connect their predictive semantic understanding of the world to that of the robot through the explainable relationships between the inputs and outputs. For example, I mentioned the tapping of the brakes on an autonomous vehicle. If a designer can then understand that the autonomous vehicle tapped the brakes because there was a pedestrian that was tracked as moving towards the road, but there was no crosswalk and the vehicle tapped the brakes, now we can close the loop and say, we understand the distribution of that sort of event happening in the road network, and we can either handle it by reducing the domain of the vehicle or actually just creating a different out outcome for that scenario. If we just have inter interpretability but no semantics, it's harder to do this kind of predictive analysis. So what are the things we gain if we build interpretable systems. I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on three that I think are the most, that are most prominent. The first one I've already touched on, and that is being able to predict success. As designers, we want to understand the domain of success for the things we build. We would love to build things that are successful everywhere, but that's not reality. Right now, there is a domain in which we will be successful, and we want to understand that. That's essential to build things that meet their intended applications, and also so that we can let our customers know what they can expect of autonomous systems. To do this, answering why output equals function of input and prior is important. Imagine the domains of the inputs and outputs of a robotic system. Imagine you're building this and you want to deploy it. If we're lucky, we might be able to sample the entirety of the input domain. We might be able to say, we know exactly what sort of scenarios we're going to be tackling. So we know the input domain. We can sample it. Then we can find the output domain of that and say, OK, we know exactly what's going to happen. OK, maybe that's a little unrealistic. Let's say we can just take enough samples from the input domain that we have a representative distribution that creates a posterior distribution. Now we know exactly what to expect when this is deployed. And in that case, we don't need explainability. Because we can, just based on statistics, say to our customers what to expect. And we know what to expect. At least in my experience, in reality, this is seldom possible. By definition, almost, autonomous robots are meant to handle a bewilderingly wide domain of scenarios, which means that it's not really possible to sample the input domain. It might be that whatever we built generalizes across the entire intended input domain. 
But we would also need to verify that as designers. We would need to know that whatever was thrown into this thing inside the design domain that we intended, it would be able to handle. The ex example that I brought up here is, is that of an adversarial attack on a classifier. So here we have an imperceptible change to an input of a classifier that would otherwise be quite good at telling us that it's being given a picture of a school bus as an input. And the school bus is then classified as an ostrich. So that might make us think twice about how we had implicitly assumed the system works. Because we always build an implicit explanation about how su such a thing works, especially once you read the paper and you try it yourself. You say, OK, this is how it works. But this might give you pause. So if we want to make assertions about when things will work and to predict success, we might be able to use explainability. Let, let me give you an example. With the school bus that was classified as an ostrich, if we could get to a point where we said, where we knew that whatever model we had used the parts of the school bus, and it would need all the parts to be there, and the parts of the school bus are the windshield and the side doors and the mirrors, they would have to be consistently colored so it wouldn't confuse them from different vehicles, and they would have to be in a particular geometric location that would be consistent with a projection of a 3D school bus, what we could then do is make an assertion about how likely it is to mistake a school bus as an ostrich based on our understanding of the prior on the appearance of school buses. In a similar way, if robotic systems are explainable, we can connect our understanding of the domain that in which they operate with the explainable relationship between their inputs and outputs, leveraging the domain ex experience that we have. This example is, uh, is really fresh in my mind because w with, when planning is explainable, I as a de designer can then make an assertion about whether or not the planner that I'm building will be successful in the domain that it's going to be running at. Because I will look at the domain and I will say, my understanding of the prior of the domain is this. It's not possible for me to sample the entire domain. And when a planner gives me the ability to see why it chose a particular path or why it failed to find a path, then I as a designer can say, this will work or not work in the intended domain. Yes. Yes. So a planner is just an optimizer. Mm -hmm. Just because it found a solution, that doesn't explain why this is the solution to the problem it was posed to. I mean, these neural networks that classify ostriches, they're the outcome to an optimization process, right? So I, I wouldn't agree that just because a planner told you, OK, this is the, the minimum I'm finding, that, that in itself is not explanatory to a human. I agree. Right, so the answer is not an explanation. An explanation is why the answer was why the answer was given in the first place. So a black box. The answer to that is it looked at the gradient in a thousand places and got you to that point. That doesn't make sense to a human. At some point, the answer might be that there's a, there was an optimization. But as a designer, you would construct a cost function. As a designer, you would uh, maybe turn the input and create an abstraction of that. And all of those little pieces will be. Uh, parts of the compositional answer to why that happened. For example, uh, why did our robot get stuck in the doorway? Well, of course, at the end of all of what happened was there was an optimization that was trying to find a path, and it found no path. But the input we gave to that system was from a classifier that tried to classify geometry as traversable or not traversable. We could, we could backtrack from that to get an explanation of what my, my, what I'm trying to say is that the compositionality of the answers that the individual pieces can give will give you an answer at the end. But you're right that at the form of it might just be that the final piece just did an optimization and failed. Yeah. I mean, 
I feel like that in a lot of cases, what you're asking for is sort of a contrastive explanation. You want to know, why did it do this, rather than the thing that I consider to be correct? So for example, you could say, rather than just say, why didn't you go through the door? You can imagine there are a lot of explanations that could be associated with that robot in that state. Like, why is it at 44 millimeters from the left side rather than 47? But if you don't care about that, that's not an explanation that's useful. So I, I think in the, it seems, seems like maybe to talk about an explanation, you have to specify not just what the robot did, but some other thing that is probably the thing you wanted it to do. Yes. And to explain why this rather than that. You could ask for a lot of different explanations why this, you know, and different explanations would be appropriate for different sort of counterfactual, yeah. you know, things that you wanted it to do. I, I will actually get to that because the, you're right. There is a distinction between the capacity for explanation and getting an explanation. So a system might have semantics that mean that we could get an explanation if we extracted the bits, but we still have to do that. We have to, if you imagine the logical sentence, it has to be formed. And, I, and I'll address this. This requires, as a designer, to think ahead and say, what explanations would I want to get uh, out of my system? So first, I have to make, the, make sure that the pieces of the puzzle are there to form the explanation, but then I have to actually form the explanation. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to reinforce what Josh said. Um, there's some work in the planning community that looks at um, contrapositives. Like when a planner fails, you hallucinate a set of alternate worlds, and then you see in which of those worlds it succeeded. Mm -hmm. And then you say, hey, if only, if only the coffee mug were here, I would succeed. Right. Um, would you consider that an explanation? If only the coffee mug were here, then I would succeed. Right, so one way to take a black box planner and then to create an explanation is to create I guess, exactly what Josh was saying. Uh, you, set a, you create a set of counterfactuals. Right. You say, I hallucinate 100 worlds that are different from this current world. I find the worlds in which I have succeeded. And I use the delta, the difference between my current world and the other world, as a means of sort of explaining how I could have succeeded. Mm -hmm. And so it's a contrapositive that you're using. If only X were true, I would be successful. So the angle that this concept of explanator became utilitarian to me is in connecting it to what I know about the domain. So if that allows you to make assertions about when that planner would fail or be successful in the domain of your choice, based on the sampling of the domain of success and failure, then I would say, yes, that's an explanation that's useful. But if it only tells you the delta from where you are to a, a potential success, but doesn't allow you to make assertions that generalize across the domain that you're trying to get to, which is where you're, the human designer is, I'm connecting the human designer to the explanation, then while it is an explanation, it doesn't help, in, it doesn't help establish the benefits that I, I will get to. Uh, so so maybe, maybe hold the thought and see if, if it connects at, at, at the end. Um, so I, I, I was mentioning uh, the, the first uh, advantage as being predicting success. The, the second advantage that, ha that, that I have a lot of experience with is, is diagnosing failure. So this is true for both systems that are classical or ones that are uh, ML-based or, or hybrids. Uh, in a classical system, an unexplained failure uh, typically means that you have, to, you have to have some theories about what happened in the failure, go back, Reinstrument your system to get the data to figure out why. With ML systems, I would say that that's the case, but there's also another option. You could collect data about the failure and train your system to handle it. I see this constantly, just add more data. The problem as a designer is that you're trying to tackle some application, and you have to, at some level, be certain that you're not going to be continuously surprised by failure. And that's where I'm connecting the ideas of the explainability of the system and the domain knowledge of the designer. Without some sort of explanation as to how the system is coming up with an answer, we cannot connect those two concepts together. The canvas cut that failed in the doorway was a hybrid ML and classical system that underwent an unexplainable failure. At that time, 
I was not able to figure out what was going wrong. Even though the explanations were in the system, there was no way for me to get them. What's worse, that I couldn't get them in the moment did not mean that I could get them later. I did not have the requisite logging in place to get the explanations out. And I think, at least for me, this demonstrates the importance of system level explainability. The components can tell you why they did the little things that they did. But at the system level, what I'm interested in is at the very top of the apex, why didn't you move forward through the door? Again, I, 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 I recognize that these are really simple concepts. But over the years, the number of times that we continuously butt up against the lack of explainability at the system level truly astounded me. I think the reason for that is that system level explainability is a joint exercise between science and engineering that is formidable. Being explain explainable doesn't mean being easily accessible. Depending on how easy it is to access explanations, they could be completely useless. Modern robots are consist of tens or hundreds of interconnected components. Each one of those may have a piece of the answer like we were discussing before. If those are not out, you have no idea what happened. Even though explanations may exist, the challenge of filtering out the noise and getting the answer that you're looking for itself can be formidable. So I mentioned predicting success and I went over diagnosing failure. I think the most important one, though, is in the context of working with people, building trust. Building trust with the customers and the operators that will use your product. We, we, I've so far focused on designers. This is top of mind for us. We're all designers of these systems. But the people that will use our creations for the longest time are not us. They're the customers. They're the operators. And explainability can have a very profound effect on their ability to trust the system that you've built to do the work. The central idea here is something that is very key in design. And it's that of a conceptual model. So a conceptual model is something you form in your mind that tells you how you would interact with a device. That if I flick the switch, there's some flow chart, the light turns on. And if I flick the switch, the light turns off. In fact, before we started here, that little panel there malfunctioned. And it had us all going on for a spin because there was a conceptual model we formed about how that panel should operate. And it did not go to that. There was, there was a lack of trust there as well, I'm telling you. But the, the conceptual models allow us to use these devices without training. Because we already know the, how the device should work. We have an expectation. We're also not surprised by what the device does if it matches our conceptual, the conceptual model we've formed of it. Unsurprisingly, the more complex the device, the more complex the conceptual model for, for, for the operators to, to come up with. If you're unable to grasp the conceptual model, you will lose trust in that device because it will, will constantly surprise you to the negative. If you trust your Tesla too much, it's going to get you killed at some point. Maybe it's healthy to be skeptical of any artifact at all times. I agree with you. And I'm very skeptical of the product that you <laughs> mentioned. Uh, in the context that we were deploying robots, we were trying to make people's lives easier. Just to get through. And to some respect, there is no time for skepticism, because you want something that will deliver. And if it doesn't deliver, if it's, being, if it's stuck in a doorway, all you want to do is just get it out of the way, because I want to get my work done. So I agree with you. In this particular case of the robot that is in a production process, things are a little uh, more, more crucial, that, that there needs to be strong trust between the operators and the device. One thing I want to stress is that operators will see system level explainability. Their conceptual model interacts with the system, not the components. So your components can be very explainable. Your system 
is not communicating that explainability to the, to the customers, they don't care if the components are uh, explainable. And it, the communication could be implicit or explicit. We as humans have conceptual, model of, of conceptual models of other humans. We expect them to behave a certain way. And that can be a tool. You can build a cart that behaves the way a cart does when it's pushed by a human. And what that will do is it'll latch onto the conceptual model that people have built of carts that get pushed by people. And if you don't break that, you can build a lot of trust with the customer. This is a tall order because humans are just incredibly complex. So if ever your, your solution is to match the complexity of a behavior model of a human, you've picked a really healthy challenge. But you can also hijack other generally known conceptual models in your device to build that sort of trust. As an example, the cot that we built has lights that are white in the direction of forward motion and red in the direction of uh, in the direction facing away from the motion. And this we're taking a conceptual model that's understood by everyone from looking at vehicles and applying it. So there's no need to further train. So the explanation is evident. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how to improve explainability. And I have three ideas that have that are general enough that I think they're worth sharing. The first strategy and the most impactful one is simplicity. Simple systems have fewer components. They have shallower abstractions. They generate less telemetry. By definition, they're also more straightforward to explain. I don't know if you've ever worked on old cars. But if you ever work on a car from like the 70s or the 80s, and you open the bonnet, if you know what the components do, you see the whole diagram right in front of you. You can just see all the, the pieces. You know when the spark plugs are going to fly because the distributor is going to make the contact, so on and so forth. If you open up a modern car, well, first of all, it's very hard to see anything because of the, the way the things are configured. But there is an enormous amount of complexity that's locked in to the ECU. And while that explainability exists for the designers of that ECU as an operator, it's completely opaque. I have no idea. Leveraging system level simplicity is really challenging. And the reason I say that is because it is not just an engineering challenge. I wish it were. To build simple systems, one has to, in my experience, work back from the customer, work back from the requirements that the core value add that you're trying to deliver, and then devise the simplest technical implementation that's possible. Without a bias towards simplicity and working back from the customer is hard to not over-engineer systems, in my experience. The second strategy I'd like to offer is just enough modularity. So before we talked about the semantic meaning of interfaces and the, how they help create compositional explanations so that we can get our explanation at the system level, just enough modularity will create the meaningful semantics if there is a capability, a capacity to have them. But the reason I say just enough is because modularity is in, is in contention with the first uh, solution that I was uh, presenting, which is simplicity. Too much modularity creates needless interfaces. And it can hamper explana explainability not due to the absence of semantic information, but the overabundance. There are a couple of different modularization strategies that I have come across over the years, such as architecture should follow organization. So your components should have boundaries that have boundaries at the teams. Or components should be single purpose. They should only have one thing that they do. Unfortunately, I have not found something that is a rule that you can that I have been able to apply in every project. For example, 
human organizations are very hard to manage and their bounds move on their own accord, it does not seem like you would want to tie down your architecture in that way. And also the concept of single purpose itself is subjective. What is the purpose of the component? You can have different layers of it. And so it is not clear that a component should be this size or this size. But what has always been clear is that there is an elbow in the curve between modularity and simplicity. And looking for that elbow should be a goal of every project. I, I want to give you an example of too much modularity. So early on in Canvas, we, we had this great idea to make our chassis, the hardware design, super modular. So it was meant to be built out of these different components that would plugged together, and the idea was that it would be really easy to repair or to upgrade in the field. So we built this on the left with all the different models clicking together, and what it ended up doing is creating a ton of complex interconnects and making all the little individual components extremely hard to access. This is obvious in hindsight, but it's a great example of how a, just a push towards modularity can take you way over to the complex side of things. We reverted out of this, and now we just have a big, wide open chassis that you can take the lid off and see everything, and it's magical in comparison. There are exactly similar examples in software design, where a drive towards creating an interface out of everything and making components out of everything can just quickly run over a system in terms of complexity. One reason for modularity is that different organizations can build different modules and then sell them to each other. If you want to do something big, it takes like Apple to you know, break down the modules and make an integrated thing. But if you're not a trillion dollar company, you're stuck with little modules. Yes. Because you can't do the whole thing. Th that is true. So th if you think about that graph, the elbow might be in a different place for you. But my experience has been that in every situation, there is a way to go beyond that point, and there's a way to go not be at that point, and then you're just compromising simplicity and modularity together. But I agree with you. I want to give you another example. Our, we are interested in identifying the six degree of freedom pose of objects that we, ident we, we identify in the scene, we see from our cameras. Uh, and at a system level, if you think about this component, it just has very one very simple purpose, which is images go in, and classifications of objects and their six stuff pose goes out. But if we look inside the component, there is a possibility of different levels of modularity. For example, our model could directly regress from pixels to the six stuff parameters, quaternion and, and translation parameters uh, uh, per cell of the objects we detect, or Another way we could do it is we could regress for each object to the eight corner points projected into the screen of the bounding box of the pose. I want to focus on the latter case because it allows us at very, at the very first level to explain why a particular pose was given out. OK, because the corner <coughs> points were regressed at these locations, great. But we could also go one more uh, layer deeper. We could analyze each corner point, figure out the relevant features that influence the corner point. You see where I'm going with this. You could form a cascade of explanations that eventually would tell you why, let's say, a forklift was detected at this pose at this location of the image. Now, we are forcing abstractions by doing this. We're forcing the network or whatever model we are, to first find the abstractions of the corner points and then regress on the pose. And that could be suboptimal. And so I'll put this to you, that given the value of explainability, the three, the three advantages of predicting success, diagnosing failure, and building trust, it is worth considering whether this price is worth paying. And I think it is. Go ahead. A quick question. I, I know we're running out. Actually, I, I'll, I'll save it for later. OK. We don't have a lot of time. So. Uh, the third strategy that I want to talk about is visualization and communication. Like we discussed, there is no benefit to explainability if it cannot be communicated out to uh, designers and operators. And while simplicity and modularity help,
they will just create the capacity for explanations, not the explanations themselves. This is really challenging in, mod in modern robots just because of how many components comprise a modern robot, each with their own explanations. And some of those components themselves might have millions of parameters. There's too many bits to display. And uh, bringing out relevant explanations is key. Early on in Canvas, we wanted to have all of our robots explain to us what was happening. And so we threw it all into a Slack channel. And this is just a, a snapshot of the madness that, that came out of that. The messages were based on design time predictions. This goes back to your point that we had made as designers as to the explanations that we would want in a future date. And it quickly became apparent that this was too much. So how do, how do we filter this out? The first thing that's really important that the messages have to be diagnostic rather than reporting. If a message says something happened, it's not an explanation. But that distinction can be really easily lost. Uh, and what ends up happening if you just have reporting is that your engineers spend a ton of time. For every message, they have to go in and extract an explanation that has a capability of being, being given, but it's not there. After too many deployments, this, uh, oops. This, this channel was completely overrun. And so we had to implement a lot of these things to filter it out. And obviously, successfully predicting every possible explanation that you want in the future is impossible. We just don't know all the things that could happen. So there must be a way for us to, explain, to, to obtain the explanations after the fact. And this, the concept here is, is logging. And just like testing, logging can be placed on a spectrum. On one side, you have extremely precise and uh, sorry, extremely narrow, but very lightweight. And on the other side, you have extremely broad, but heavyweight. And so what's worked for us is logging across the entire spectrum. Here, you see a demonstration of the heaviest logging that we have possible, which is logging the entire sensor input and the state. We can't sustain this for more than you know, a minute or so. And so using a spectrum of logging with the right triggers, with the right tools to extract the information and bring it back to the designers can help when the explanation is required but is not predicted ahead of time. What's the, what's the, raw data? the raw data here is all the sensory input. And anything as an output of a state estimator, just the car? Uh, you're, uh, you're seeing the state estimation for the, for the vehicle, yes. Yes, and there's object detection and sort of segmentation going on. So I just, I, we've, we've come a long way since this moment. And uh, our cuts now have a number of signals that are available from a web interface. They're available from diagnostic tools. They're available remotely. And they also trigger uh, explanations that get saved on the robot that can be, that can be extracted if needed. We actively strive for this kind of explainability because of too many, uh, too many events like this happening, too many scenarios like this happening. And while it is very challenging, it has helped us predict what will be successful. It has helped us diagnose failure, and it's helped us build trust with our customer. I hope that has been interesting for you, some food for thought in your next project. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. to a question. So you know, it wouldn't be possible to be logging explanations as you go, because you don't know what question. That's right. Be. So you're logging raw data or something. You're logging something that is going to be used to create an explanation once you know what the question is. So then it's sort of like a, I don't know, maybe a database sort of model, where there's queries. You want to make sure you can efficiently answer those queries. But in advance, you don't know what the queries are. Yes. Uh, and what ends up happening is that as you ask the questions, you recognize that you want those questions answered in the future. So then you will, you will actually code up the answer so that you're not just looking at the raw data. You will get the explanation. So with that dump out of Slack, which we had all the robots just constantly reporting things, uh, those were put in place because we knew that there were answers to explanations we, we cared about. But we kept adding to those. 
because we would find an unexplainable failure, which would require us to go back to the raw data. Hopefully it was available. If not, you're one step behind because you first have to make sure the data is there and then you work your way up. Sometimes the explanations would be no longer required because whatever scenario you had that was causing issues is now handled. So. Yeah, one other comment, and it's sort of related, which is I think you know, what's going to be considered useful information is the stuff that you know, deviates from the model that you had. Like, for example, you know, with it not going through the door, you know, if, if the cause that we would attribute to it is because it you know, misperceived something, then that's the most useful part. But you can imagine if it's giving you an automated explanation, it might also say, and then I planned this trajectory, and then I executed the trajectory. And you don't care about that, yes. because that's all correct behavior that's not doesn't deviate from your sort of probabilistic yes. expectation. So the, the explanations that were the most useful were the ones that were the most crafted, unfortunately. But let's say in the case of stuck in the doorway, we have an expectation that we will have some amount of progress, some velocity of progress through our intended trajectory. If that's violated, what we want to save is, like you said, exactly the pieces that matter. What we were seeing, the classification of obstacles, the path we were intending to take, and that forms an answer. Yes. So is this to say that in a way what you're asking the system to do is, like, you're taking a probabilistic system, but you're asking it in a way to generate the state of a classical model wherein it can say, I see, a, I see an object and I can't drive over that object. And that sort of intermediate sort of explanation of state is something that you as a, as a developer can then, can then think about and work with. Uh, for, the, for, the, for the purposes of diagnosing failure, Yes, absolutely. But to build trust and to predict success, you need more than just a, a scenario. You need an explanation, a theory of operation as, I'm going to not drive through geometry that is classified as uh, uh, untraversable because. And if that chain of explanation exists, then I as a designer can then connect that to my prior about what geometry looks like in the domain of operation that I'm targeting my application in, and I can make assertions whether my robot is going to be constantly stopping or not. Is that? Mm -hmm. We're out of time now. Uh, thank you so much.